or excuse me, 2 Samuel chapter 24 is where we are going to begin in just a moment. James, thank you so much for leading us in our worship. What a treat to get to do that again with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, all of you. A few things by way of introduction as you turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel 24. I want to first of all thank Troy and Amy so much for having us over this evening and the whole crew, all the kids, and we just uh, stuffed our faces until we were full and had chaos, controlled chaos, but it was a lot of fun. And, And on that note, I want to thank all the parents. I understand having three young ones, how hard it is to have five long nights in a row. And it just means so much. It shows me your heart and your willingness to be here and bring your children. And I just want to commend this congregation for especially the way the parents have brought their children every night to this meeting. And and it shows me what's happening in your homes and the kind of way that the Lord is honored in your families. You are to be commended for all of that. And I just want to say thank you. I can't believe we are at the end of our week. And it's, it's one of those things where as the uh, guest preacher, oftentimes you are expected to come in and encourage a group. But as typically happens, I feel like I am leaving so much more built up and edified than I possibly could leave any of you. You have just made such an impression on me. There are so many wonderful families here. I am so grateful for the relationships that we forged. I look forward to growing in those relationships over the years. And I will say this, though, if if you happen to completely forget me, though, that is completely okay, because we're not here to lift up anybody's name except that of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here tonight. And we want to turn our attention to Jesus again for our last night together as we return to our series on the shepherd king, looking at David and the life of David And then turning our attention and looking at how the life of David ultimately points to the true shepherd king, Jesus Christ. And how there is so much fulfillment in Christ from what we read about David. And then as usual, we turn our attention each night to learning some very important lessons that we can glean from the very, very relatable life of David. David has come a long way in this week, hasn't he? From the very young shepherd boy who's not even considered by Jesse among the sons to present to Samuel. Who would be anointed to be the next king. The young boy who would charge into battle to take on Goliath head on full of faith. And we are now nearing the end of David's recorded life. And 1 Kings is going to record David's final instructions to Solomon in his old age. And this final bit of text, again, that we're going to be at in 2 Samuel 24, right before 1 Kings, is going to, again, bring us to another difficult time in the life of David, much like we looked at last evening as we talked about the sin that David would commit against Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite. And in this story, the Lord's anger is going to be kindled against Israel and against the King David. And they are going to suffer a dreadful consequence as a result. However, the story is not going to end all bad. The story is going to end with God's mercy, as well as a wonderful lesson about the cost of sacrifice. Just as we looked at last night, how sin comes at a great cost. We're going to see this evening that likewise, sacrifice must come also at a great cost. And so we want to jump right into our story and then connect it to Jesus and then conclude with some thoughts for ourselves. This is the story of David, the census and the threshing floor. 2 Samuel 24, beginning in verse 1. The Lord's anger burned against Israel. And let's just pause there for a moment. We are given no other context as to why. It was a fun game on the way up here. Ava was asking my oldest what we're talking about with David's life. And so I explained it to her. And she said, why is God angry at Israel? And I said, I don't know. So it became a game of 20 questions where she guessed anything under the sun as to why God would have been angry with his people. But we just don't know. We can speculate all we want. But what we are going to see is that God is going to use a sin David is going to commit 
to not only punish David, but also punish the people of Israel. And so it continues. It says that the Lord stirred up David. Your version might say provoked David against them to say, go count the people of Israel and Judah. And so the king said to Joab, the commander of his army, go through all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and register the troops so I can know their number. And Joab replied to the king, may the Lord your God multiply the troops a hundred times more than they are while my Lord, the king looks on. But why does my Lord, the king want to do this? And yet the king's order prevailed over Joab and the commanders of the army. So Joab and the commanders of the army left the king's presence to register the troops of Israel. Looking at this text, the very first thing that might jump out at us is that it says that God stirred up David or provoked David or yours might say incited David. What is going on here when we read this? Is this suggesting that God was responsible for causing David to sin. And obviously we look at this and we recognize that is not what this text is saying. James will tell us that God can neither tempt nor is he tempted to sin himself. But much rather what we are seeing here is that God will use even us in our evil actions and in our free will to bring about his judgment and his purposes. God does this frequently. The most obvious example would be the death of the Messiah upon the cross. Though they, the Jews, killed Jesus by their own choice and handed him over to lawless men, Jesus would make it very clear to Pilate the reason he was in this position, the reason that he had this authority is because it was given to him for such an occasion. God uses the actions of men, even through our wickedness, to sometimes accomplish His will. And that is exactly what we see taking place here. And in this text it says, David had a heart to number the people. But not just number the people, but David wanted to take a census of the soldiers themselves. Why is God going to be so angry at David about this? Because as good students of the Old Testament, we actually recognize that David doing this in and of itself was actually not wrong. Moses himself is going to do this in Numbers chapter 1 and verses 1 through 4. And Saul himself will do this in 1 Samuel 11 and verse 8 before they would go into battle. This in and of itself was not a wrong practice. But what I believe is taking place here is the motive behind why David did such a thing. There is usually two different camps when you read scholarly material trying to figure out what's taking place here and why has David sinned so greatly. The first suggests that what is happening here is a misapplication from the people of a command given in Exodus chapter 30. Now we don't have time to read this text, but bottom line, what Exodus 30 details is a census that was to be taken up among the people and that when they took this census, they were also to pay a tax, all the people, regardless of their social position, and that that tax would go to Re, um, repairs for the temple and all of the administrative functions of the priesthood and that if the people did not do this correctly what was promised in Exodus 30 is that there would be a plague brought upon the people and so many will look at this text and think this is obviously what's taking place I would like to give you a, another possibility and this is what I'm going to refer to as Nebuchadnezzar syndrome and we should go back in our minds to the book of Daniel and remember when Nebuchadnezzar would walk out and he looks at all of his kingdom and he looks at all of his gardens and he starts to do what as he sees everything? He starts to pat himself on the back, doesn't he? 
And he starts to pride himself and look at my strength and my wonder and my majesty and my kingdom and all these things that I have done. And when we look at the text, Joab himself seems to be confused as to why David wants to number not just the people, but why he wants to number the troops. And this process was a long process. What the text tells us and goes on to say in verse 9 is that this process would take 10 months, 9 months and 20 days. And that at the end of this census, what they discovered is that they had nearly a million and a half men that were in fighting condition in Judah and Israel. And once David arrives at this number, I want you to notice the text in verse 10. It says, David's conscience troubled him that he had taken a census of the troops. David himself would write throughout the Psalms, some trust in chariots, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. What seems to be taking place here is that David in his pride is wanting to know just how strong He is from a military perspective. I want to know how big my army is, how vast my kingdom is, and just how strong I am. David is fueling his own ego and his own pride when David would do well to remember what God has reminded him of time and time again. Who was the one that won all the battles for David? Was it not the Lord himself? God did not need a great number in order to deliver victory to the people. David need only remember his first battle against Goliath to know that truth. And yet here David falls guilty to his own pride. And he is not going to need a prophet to reveal it to him this time. David himself will be pricked by his own sin. And he says to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I've done. Now, Lord, because I have been very foolish, please take away your servant's guilt. David prays for forgiveness. David handles this the right way. But as I often tell my children, though you are forgiven for what you have done, it does not remove the consequences for what you have done. And so we are going to see another prophet enter the life of David. David has worked with numerous prophets, hasn't he? He has worked with the prophet Samuel. He has worked with the prophet Nathan. Now we are going to see the prophet Gad, who is stirred up by the Lord to go and speak to David the next morning. And ultimately what David is going to be given is an opportunity to choose his punishment. I'm looking out and there's some that are old enough here to relate to this. Were you ever told to go and pick your own switch growing up? You ever have to do that growing up? And that was always such a a chore, wasn't it? Because you didn't want to go too light or else dad was going to go out and get a bigger one, wasn't he? And you didn't want to go too heavy because you didn't want to get an unnecessarily big beating. And so you try to make this decision of choosing your punishment. The Lord is going to come to Gad and essentially is going to come to David and he's going to say, choose your punishment. This is what the text says, beginning in verse 12. It says, this is what the Lord says. I am offering you three choices. Choose one of them and I will do it for you. And so Gad went to David. And told him his choices. And he asked him, do you want, behind door number one, three years of famine to come on your land? Do you want, behind door number two, to flee from your foes for three months while they pursue you? Or, behind door number three, would you rather have plague in your land for three days? All of these punishments, you will see a correlation between them, won't you? That they go from less of an urgent severity, but over a longer period of time. Famine for three years, would actually, which actually might actually have been the worst. 
Because when you have a famine that lasts for three years, it does not just affect a kingdom for three years. It would actually affect a kingdom for more like seven to ten years to finally catch up on what they had lost over that period of three years. But it would have been slow and drawn out. The next option that he gives him is to be pursued by his enemies. David has done that for a long time in his life, hasn't he? He ran for 10 years from Saul. And then the final one would be like ripping it off like a band-aid. Three days of plague, pestilence. David is going to respond. And David is going to throw himself at the mercy of God. And he answers Gad and says in verse 14, I have great anxiety. Can you imagine being the one to make this choice? That did not just affect you, but affected all of the kingdom. You couldn't win with this choice, could you? And so David says the only thing he can. He says, let us fall into the Lord's hands. Because his mercies are great. But don't let me fall into human hands. David will have nothing to do with being pursued by his enemies for three months and likely was saying he would have nothing to do with famine because oftentimes famine came about because of war and because of roads and trade being blocked off, among other reasons. And so Daniel, uh, David here is going to say, I am going to throw myself at the mercy of God. And so the Lord will respond accordingly. The text tells us in verse 15 that the Lord sent a plague on Israel from that morning until the appointed time from Dan to Beersheba, from north to south. And I want you to notice what the result in a period of three days was. It says 70,000 men died. And then the angel of the Lord extended his hand toward Jerusalem even to destroy it. And let's pause there in the text. This is a severe, severe plague sent on the people. And we do not have a proper understanding of pestilence in the United States. We do not face the kinds of things that they would have faced in the ancient Near East and the kinds of things that took place commonly in that period in time. There are accounts in many different cultures of locusts being so thick as they traveled through different areas that if you were left outside, people were actually eaten alive by locusts in that period in time. Can you imagine that kind of death? This is what comes upon the people and 70,000 of them die. And God is even intent on turning his face towards Jerusalem, the capital city, and even destroying it as well. But before this takes place, David was right to throw himself at the mercy of God. And it says at the beginning or the middle of verse 16, the Lord relented concerning the destruction and said to the angel who was destroying the people, Enough, withdraw your hand now. And the angel of the Lord was on the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. The account in First Chronicles is going to depict this angel with his sword still unsheathed, sitting there on this man's threshing floor, scaring the absolute wits out of this owner who witnesses this angel and sees him right before him. And so this brings us to the last part of our text. David sees the angel striking the people, and this likely is a description of when God relented, because God is going to hear the prayer of David. And he prays to God and says, look, I'm the one who sinned. I am the one who has done wrong. But these sheep, he looks at them as innocent sheep. What have they done? Please let your hand be against me. And my father's family. David does not realize God is using him as a tool to also punish the people. And so Gad is going to come to David that day. And everything stops. And he tells him, go up and set up an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor 
of Arona, the Jebusite. And so David goes up in obedience to Gad's command, just as the Lord commanded. And Arana looked down and he sees the king and his servants coming towards him. And he goes out and he pays homage to the king with his face on the ground. This is an exciting day for this fellow. He's got an angel over here and the king is showing up over here. This is a full day for Arana the Jebusite. And he pays homage to the king. And certainly he knows the devastation that's been taking place. And his response to what David is going to ask of him is extraordinarily appropriate. David comes to him and he asks the king, why has my Lord the king come here to his servant? And David responds, he says, to purchase, to buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord so the plague on the people may be halted. Now I want you to put yourself in this man's position. His sons are with him. An angel stands next to him with his sword drawn who is destroying the people. And David says, if we build an altar on your property, then all of this will be averted. What would you do if you were in his position? What would you do? You would say what? Take it, right? Take it. It's all yours. I don't want any of this stuff. I don't need my threshing floor. I don't need my property. I don't need my oxen. You just take all of it. If it's going to keep me safe and my family safe and avert this plague from the people. And that's exactly what Aruna says. He says to David, my Lord and my King, take whatever you want and offer it. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering and the threshing sledges and the ox yokes for the wood. Your majesty, Arana gives everything here to the King. And he said, may the Lord your God accept you. I want you to just take a moment to realize how generous of a sacrifice this was from Arana. He was giving up his entire estate, everything that he had to his name, freely, he was willing to part with, being given nothing in return. And he tells David, may God accept your offering. And you would think that David would accept such a generous, wonderful, merciful offer from Arana. But David, in fact, does not for a very important reason. David says to him, I insist on buying it from you for a price. For I will not offer to the Lord, my God, burnt offerings that cost me nothing. And so David bought the threshing floor and the oxen. For 20 ounces of silver. And he built an altar to the Lord there. And offered burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. And then the Lord was receptive to the prayer for the land. And the plague on Israel ended. And so ends the book of 2 Samuel. What a story towards the end of David's life. David refuses to offer a sacrifice to God that will cost him nothing. Such an offering would not be a sacrifice in that sense. David insisted on it coming at a great cost. And so we now want to spend our time, as we have concluded this story, this is one of my favorite lessons to give on this series, and this is the best way to end this series. Because I believe this story brings out perhaps the most important lesson concerning Jesus that we must come to understand as Christians. And that is that sacrifice is only worth something if it comes at a cost. In David's case, in the shepherd king's case, it was a monetary cost. He would buy the threshing floor for 500 grams of silver. And this is often the case with sacrifice. When you go back and you look at Leviticus chapters 1 through 5, and you see all of the different sacrifices that the people were called to 
participate in. The burnt offering and the sin offering and the peace offering and the trespass offering. All of these different things that they were called to do. All of these sacrifices required not something, but something great, didn't they? It would have been the first fruits of their flock. It would have been something that was without defect, something that was quite valuable, that truly was a sacrifice to offer it. The best of what you had. Not something that you couldn't trade for two pigeons. The best, purely, that you could possibly provide. And yet, all of the burnt offerings and all of the sacrifices... And every single unblemished, perfect lamb, perfect ox, perfect goat, perfect anything that the people ever offered would be nothing in comparison to the sacrifice offered from Christ Jesus. Open up in your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, we want to read verses 1 through 10. As we come to understand the great cost of the sacrifice of Jesus. Beginning in verse 1, the Hebrew writer says, Since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the reality itself of those things, it can never perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifices they continually offer year after year. Otherwise, they wouldn't have stopped being offered. Since the worshipers, purified once for all, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in the sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year after year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore... As he was coming into the world, he said, You did not desire sacrifice and offering, but you prepared a body for me. You did not delight in whole burnt offerings and sin offerings. And then I said, See, it is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. After he says above, you did not desire delight in sacrifices and offerings, whole burnt offerings and sin offerings, which were offered according to the law. He then says, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first to establish the second. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Brothers and sisters, Jesus was the first fruits of all things. The greatest among all. God could not have offered anything superior than the body of His own Son for our sake. Everything else pales in comparison. How much, my friends, does God love you? What would you be willing to sacrifice for others? I guarantee you your children are not on that list. We would do anything to protect our children. And yet the Father and the Son willingly lay down their lives for us. We could not pay the great cost for our sin. There is only one who could, Jesus Christ the righteous. We must recognize that serving God certainly comes at a great cost to ourselves, as we will see, but nothing in comparison to what God Himself would give. I want to turn to two passages. First of all, to Micah chapter 6. Usually when we look to Micah chapter 6, we are talking about what does the Lord require of you but to 
Do justice and love faithfulness and walk humbly with your God. But I want you to look at what is stated in verses 6 through 7 and understand the typology and the prophecy of what Micah was saying. Micah asked, what should I bring before the Lord when I come and bow before the Lord God on high? Should I come before Him with burnt offerings and year-old calves? Would the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams or with 10,000 streams of oil? It still isn't good enough, is it? Look at what he says next. Should I give my firstborn son for my transgression? The offspring of my body for my own sin. What God would not require of us, God would require of himself. Much like God would command Abraham to go and offer up Isaac and then would send provision. God would not require of Abraham what he would require of himself. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And let's look at verses 17 through 19. This sacrifice that Jesus would give was not of coin, was not of herd. It was the blood that poured out of his body. 1 Peter chapter 1 and beginning in verse 17. If you appeal to the Father who judges impartially according to each one's works, you are to conduct yourself in reverence during your time living as strangers. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. We often, I believe, have really become deadened to the effect of the statement that Christ died for us. We say it so many times that it loses its effect sometimes in our minds. We need to be reminded of what Jesus did for us. Jesus was tortured to death for us. And he did it freely without wanting anything in return. Scourging killed most people. You know that? Most people did not survive scourging. As at the end of these whips, they would put glass and bone fragments and rocks and metal pieces and there was no limitation as to how many times they could beat you if you were not a Roman. Most accounts of Roman scourging would go on to detail how people's intestines would fall out of their bodies because of how severely they had been beaten. That their muscle tissues would be hanging from their bodies like clothing that had been ripped that you would be able to see their inner organs. And they didn't just scourge you on your back. When they were finished, they flipped you over and they would scourge your front. They scourged every part of your body. Jesus knew exactly what kind of a sacrifice was required of him. And he said, I'm willing to do that for you. And if that were not enough, then they would take the heaviest piece of wood across and strap it across his open, festering, wounded back until he could not walk anymore. And then drive nails through his feet and through his hands at such an angle that Jesus would literally be dying from asphyxiation, suffocating to death on his own blood, gurgling in his lungs. And the only way he could get air in order to speak to his mother who looked on to him and speak to John who looked on to him was to push up on those nails as blood would seethe out of his feet in order to speak just a few short words before he could no longer speak anymore. This is what Jesus went through for you and I. So the next time we say Jesus died for us, we need to consider what Jesus sacrificed, what Jesus truly went through through for us to make a sacrifice for sin cost Jesus everything 
It was the greatest sacrifice God could give. And my friends, if Jesus was willing to give everything in order to offer a sacrifice on our behalf so that we might not die, what should we be willing to sacrifice for Him? I want to look at three different applications, and then the lesson will be yours. The very first one is going to be rooted in the cause of all of this turmoil, if we have interpreted the text correctly, and that is looking at the pride of David. We read in James chapter 4 and verse 6 that God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. David and Israel's calamity could have been deterred altogether if they were not so boastful. When it comes to our own lives, our own salvation, our own gifts, our own status, whatever it might be. My brothers and sisters, when you look at the face of Christ on the cross, if you place yourself at the foot of Jesus, and look up on Him as He is bleeding out for you, which one of us is ready to boast in anything, in the things that we do or the things that we have? We have no reason to boast. We must place our hope and our trust in God. He is not only enough. He is everything. This is why Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 23, would say, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. Let not the strong man boast in his strength. But let the one who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. And that I am a God who practices justice and righteousness and loving kindness. And it's in these things that I delight, declares the Lord. We have no ground for boasting in anything. God opposes the proud. And in the face of Jesus and His sacrifice, the only proper response is in humility casting our crowns at the feet of Jesus. Our second point that we want to make this evening is going to introduce perhaps one of my favorite books ever written of all time. It is called The Cost of Discipleship by a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. If you don't know anything about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is quite an interesting person. He was a theologian. He was a spy. He was a part of the Valkyrie movement that intended to bring Hitler down during World War II. His father was forced to work for the Nazis as a psychiatrist, and he would work vehemently against them. And ultimately, Dietrich Bonhoeffer would die in a concentration camp that would be liberated just a few days after he was executed. Dietrich, before this time, before his capture, would talk about a concept that he calls cheap grace versus costly grace. And our second application tonight is do not cheapen the grace and sacrifice of Jesus. I want to read this from this small excerpt from his book. Dietrich would write and say, This is what we mean by cheap grace. The grace which amounts to the justification of sin without the justification of the repentant sinner who departs from sin and from whom sin departs. Cheap grace is not the kind of forgiveness of sin which frees us from the toils of sin. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ, living and incarnate. I love his point that he makes here about cheap grace. When I look at the cross of Jesus Christ, and I stop to consider his sacrifice and all that he went through, how could I ever 
cast it aside as though it was worth nothing. And yet that is exactly what we do every time we go back to the old man and continue in our sinful walk of life. Going back to Hebrews 10, where we began just a few moments ago, continue in the text in verse, 30, in verse 26. For if we go on deliberately sinning after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire about to consume the adversaries. Anyone who disregarded the law of Moses died without mercy based on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think one will deserve who has trampled on the Son of God? Who has regarded as profane the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know the one who has said, Vengeance is mine. I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I knew someone one time that whose life was falling apart and they needed a break. And someone reached out to them and gave them a break. And they moved for this job. And this person went out of their way to help them and to support them as their life was falling apart. And the very first week on the job, they went out and got a DUI and got thrown in jail for a couple of nights. And ironically, someone who was connected with where this person was working was the officer who would arrest him, and this would get back to his boss immediately. Such an occasion resulted in unbelievable mercy shown to this person. He was allowed to retain his job. But can you imagine how you would have felt as the employer in that moment? When you've gone out of your way to help someone, go out of your way to serve someone, and the very first thing they do is take all the grace you've given them and throw it right back in their face. Brothers and sisters, when we go back to sin... We are looking at the cross of Jesus Christ. We are looking at the bleeding face of the Messiah with thorns pressed in his brow and saying, that's not good enough. And we trample underfoot the Son of God. We spit directly in the face of Jesus. And my friends, if we approach grace in such a cheap fashion, there are great ramifications for doing so. Much rather, we are called to exercise costly grace in our life. Dietrich would go on to say the following, costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will gladly go and sell all he has. It is the pearl of great price to buy which the merchant will sell all of his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ, for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which the man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus. It is costly because it costs a man his life. And it is grace because it gives the man the only true life there is. One of my favorite books. And what Dietrich does is he brings out no truth that is unique to his own self. But he brings out the truths from the Lord's mouth himself in his ministry that are recorded in the Gospel of Luke and in chapter 9. Turn in your Bibles with me there, if you will, to Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 23. Because though we could never pay the price for our sins, only the blood of Jesus can. 
The cost to us is the same cost to Jesus. And that is everything. Just as the grace of God came at a great cost, so also it must come at a great cost cost to us. Dietrich would write this to summarize his whole work. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. That is exactly what Jesus says in Luke 9, beginning in verse 23. If anyone wishes to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will save it. What does it benefit someone if he gains the whole world and yet loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me, in my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and that of the Father and his holy angels. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. What does following Jesus cost us? What is the cost of discipleship? And Jesus makes it clear. He says everything. My friends, if you take nothing else from this lesson, take this. Jesus is not your Lord at all unless he is Lord of all. Jesus is not your Lord at all, unless he is Lord of all. Like Arona, we must be ready to willingly lay everything down at the foot of the shepherd king. And like David, the sacrifice that we offer unto God must not cost us nothing. Romans chapter 12 will bring about this idea that Dietrich would say that cheap grace is grace without discipleship. And that the opposite is true, that costly grace is a grace that brings about obedience and discipleship to Christ. Paul would say the following in Romans chapter 12. And before we read this, I want you to consider and ask yourself, what do you sacrifice in your life for Jesus? And maybe different things pop up in your mind. Maybe your time pops up in your mind or your gifts pop up in your mind or I don't know what it is that pops up in your mind. But if it's anything like that, it's already the wrong answer. Because Paul gives us the right answer as to what we ought to sacrifice for Christ. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, and I love that he bases his argument, when you consider what God has done for you, the only right and proper response, looking at the face of Jesus on the cross, is this, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Just as the will of God was to prepare a body for Jesus to be sacrificed, my friends, the will of God is the same for us. A body He has prepared for us. What do we sacrifice for Jesus? You know what the answer is? Everything. We're about to sing a song in a moment that James is going to lead us in. When I survey the wondrous cross. And as you sing that song, I want you to place yourself at the foot of the cross. And I want you to picture the bleeding, mangled, disgusting body of Jesus. And the love that put him there. And the willingness that he had to sacrifice all for you. And if we do that properly then our only response will be the same response at the very end of that song. That when we survey the wondrous cross, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all.
If you're here tonight and you're ready to give up your life, you're ready to give Jesus everything, what are you waiting for? Because in giving up everything, you will actually attain all there is to attain. Life eternal from God. Repent of your sins. Be buried with Him in baptism. You will rise to walk in the newness of life. Being forgiven all of your sins and given a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. If this appeals to you, won't you come forward now as we stand and sing the song of encouragement? Amen.